I'm starting my speech in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. Every day of your life, the state holds a gun to your head telling you exactly what to do. Every single aspect of your existence, the thing you can do in terms of when you set up your businesses, who you sell your products to, whether or not you're allowed to act in a certain way in public through, say, public displays of affection, or who you're allowed to marry, is controlled by a state that you did not choose to, vote, like, to go into. Why is this important? First of all, you cannot opt out of a state. As a result of that, often it's because of high barriers like emigration. Literally, the state can just deny you like a visa to exit. Often, they can keep you in the borders. Second of all, even if you go out of the state, you cannot opt out of the state system as a whole. So even if you go from one democracy to another democracy, you are still stuck in it. But third of all, it's because a huge amount of your life is forcefully controlled through the abuse of force, which is physical violence. As a result, you don't have a choice to do anything. Note the reparative obligation this creates. If I control every part of your life, probably I owe you a little bit of a say in how it's controlled. The problem is, constitutions don't give you that say because, surprise, surprise, before a democracy exists, no one can vote on anything. So the constitution didn't come from a vote, it came from elites who decided that something is important from their own platform. As a result, morally, opposition has to stand behind an arbitrary part of time where people got to have power and got to create a state. Fine, it was probably good for people that they created a democracy. The impact of this is you had to live with it every day of your life with no choice in how it works. The barrier on your side to change this is too high. First, it requires super majorities, which are effectively irrelevant in democracies because it requires so many people to agree on it that to the point where you just have a significant amount of opposition towards it, it cannot exist. Note, the majority matters more than the super majority because it is more people as a lower value, which means that you have a lower value to having any discussion at all. But second of all, most constitutional court decisions can't be changed at all, in which case the interpretation of what your own life is, is not in your hands. As a result, morally, I would argue that the representatives of the people, even if they're not perfect, even if the system is flawed, are more important than the court. That is the principle of has to deal with it. Now, two more practical arguments. First of all, note why constitutions are practically bad and represent conservative opinions, why democracy is likely to change this, and second of all, why this creates huge bias from a legal discussion. First of all, note why constitutions are bad. Four reasons. First of all, they're created in a context where it's very difficult for you to gain political power. Often this is a history of colonialism in places like Indonesia, in places like India, where it's difficult to even push for political changes in the first place. As a result, the people who lead the writing of the constitution were educated, rich, and protected enough to write those constitutions at that time. Often they don't represent people on the ground. As a result, they often have things like, say, the American constitution focusing on property rights and gun rights, but not having anything about women to the point where it literally says, you know, all men specifically. Second of all, it's about the beliefs in the past were obviously not relevant to the beliefs today, often they were socially conservative. So even the court is fairly like applying these constitutional rules. In India, in 2018, women were classified as chattel, in, like that is literally property. As a result of that, often the courts are required to follow a constitution that is bad in the first place. Third of all, the people themselves were not solicited when making this constitution, and hence you had no intention or capacity to even know what they wanted. In other words, even if Ambedkar and Nehru were like literal gods and wanted a really good constitution in India, they couldn't talk to the people in India because they didn't have the time to solicit their opinions. Democratic individuals do. As a result, the constitutional interpretations that are made by a court that decides like, oh, the government cannot do this because the constitution says so, often is one that did not take the people's views into account, and now the government has decided, oh, this voted party cannot do something because people in the past said it, often you are doing something that is like socially conservative. Sure, yeah. um, in a second. Uh, sure, quickly. If it is that important that people can do what they want, would you allow um, doctors to refuse to give abortions or would you allow bakers to refuse to sell game and cakes? No, so the, the thing is, right, the state decides how that doctor lives, the state decides what kind of education they get, the state decides how much money you get, and so you have a reciprocal obligation towards everyone else in your society. Like, I'm the reason that doctor is alive insofar as I work hard and give the money that keeps the economy flowing, so it owes an obligation to me. So we have a collective arbitration within the state to decide what people can do. We don't mean the state should just fuck off and let everyone do everything. Also, if you have the fiat to make everyone have perfect individual rights, then like, good luck. Okay. Fourth reason as to why the constitution is bad is that the state had to survive. So often it had a huge amount of authority and rules put in. So the constitution doesn't have that much freedom because you need to make sure people don't rebel when you're forming a state at a point like say colonialism ending. Which is why often sedition laws are extremely strong. Things like say free speech is often like, significantly like, restricted in countries like say, you know, again, Indonesia is a great example of this, but also like Malaysia and so on. As a result of that, these constitutions don't represent people. Okay, why does the court do this very badly? Why does the government do it much better? First of all, Note that if the court is politicized in a way that doesn't actually interpret the constitution, we win. Because the judges are interpreted for like 10 to 15 years, right? They've set for a huge amount of time. So even if you want politicized judges, they represent people in the past. Democratic governments represent people right now. As a result, it's more representative and thus is good. So if Ops says there's going to be some kind of change in terms of representing the people from judges, they're already losing because they're conceding our metric. Second of all, if the judges are perfectly independent, here's why they're likely to be extremely bad. First of all, 
they're unlikely to change anything in terms of their interpretations. They're probably going to stick to the most socially conservative interpretation possible because, first of all, they're highly biased towards following the Constitution. That's what they've been educated for their whole life. They've been told this is the most important document in their history, so they're emotionally unlikely to disagree with the like, perceptions of it. So that means if you like legalize game, they try to like push for like something that makes civil unions legal, where like men can marry other men. If the Constitution has something about how homosexuality is wrong, they will always part on the side of socially conservative interpretations. But second of all, their education is very like detached from the people on the ground. So often that means they're not very democratic. As a result, they don't understand the issues that people face. So even if Roe v. Wade was not perfectly good as an interpretation of the Constitution, or like, wait, that's a different one, sorry. Um, even if some like abortion law that like, kind of goes against the idea of the Constitution, which isn't exactly the perfect thing in the world, the judges will now strike it down in places which are not America, because for them, it's important that they follow their own personal preferences, which elites consider important, but they don't know what people on the ground themselves face, so they don't have that empathy to work on. Third of all, they're also elite as fuck. It's really expensive to become a judge, but it costs a lot of money to go to law school, and so the decisions are bad. Why are governments good? First of all, because it's really, really likely that people will have a huge amount of chance to vote as a result of the fact that people who vote for you are good for you as a party. So, vote or not often increases because people want to, like, if you are the party that gets someone to vote for the first time, you're likely to be the party they vote for because you're the only person they know as the first place. So, they're likely to have huge incentives to make sure people can vote in the first place, increasing turnout. Second of all, minorities are a really important voting bloc. It's really cheap to offer, like, poor people a certain amount of money, so they become very important in swinging elections, especially since they're very easy to campaign towards in the first place. But third of all, the voting system itself is often very transparent. People can see what's going on. The policies are on campus, like on, on campus, on TV. Everyone can debate each other and so on. But what is the impact on like political discussion this has, which also feeds into all of the events we talk about? First of all, all judicial decisions that might have happened in the past in a court, which are perceived as something you cannot vote on, is now something that's a political discussion. So now, it changes the discussion on abortion from whether the constitutional court is supported to a political one that forces you to make a decision on in the permanent context, which means people feel like they can actually change it and not just depend on the constitutional court. So they get more involved because they have decisions of life and death. But second of all, if the court can actually be overturned and people disagree with it, that means every decision the court makes, including on transparency in institutions, is publicly discussed. So if the court makes a bad decision or if the court is corrupt or politicized, People can now see it and overturn it and it becomes a big part of campaigns in the first place, getting a checking mechanism on the court in the first place. Note that courts have an immense amount of power in deciding how every single person in the world lives. On that, I think they should have some kind of democratic checks and balances on that opening moment. I thank the Prime Minister for that speech. I call upon the leader of the position here. Sharia misses in his speech is that these elections, the, the democracy that he prioritizes in opening government, are defined by the constitution, right? That is to say, if you give, lose faith in the constitution, and if you no longer have a decent constitution, and it can be changed by any political party you want, you are giving up in the vast majority popular system, in the vast majority the democratic system that are underpinned by the constitution, right? When you lose these democratic rights because a far right populist party is voted in, the, the fact that these elections are probably not going to happen on their side of the house where the constitution is massively changed, right? What does OG tell us firstly on the principle? They tell us that it's politically unjustified to have constitutions because people should be able to make all the changes, but notice how we already have things that people don't necessarily vote on are appointed when individuals on the ground don't have specified knowledge of topics, right? Things like federal banks, where people don't necessarily vote direct people in federal banks because of the fact that there isn't mass amounts of knowledge about the economy within the public sector. Not how this is exactly the same with law, right? This is why it's justified to have some level of non-appointed judges as opposed to elected judges in the status quo. But secondly, they tell us a lot of this, uh, a lot of these things about how people are the people people should be able to choose what they want within the law. No doubt with the reasons I gave you previously, right? People don't interpret things very well because this is a very specified knowledge in terms of in terms of legislation and in terms of law. We think it's different.
All right, no. Uh, firstly, on framing, let's talk about what these courts do. We think they do two things. Firstly, they do cases regarding constitutions, as in like interpretation of constitutions. But secondly, it's like courts of final appeals. And what, we, what these constitutions looks like is pretty inflexible, so it's not prone to change. That is to say, it's designed to prevent large-scale short-term change. Things like stopping active amounts of democratic backsliding, where you lose democratic systems because of the fact that these are defined by the constitution. It stops state failure within elections as a whole, right? What do these cases look like then? Firstly, let's talk about constitutional yeah. cases. No, we think the alternative to these cases, when you don't challenge these cases, is to actively change the institutions, which is probably pretty difficult through the means of referendum, where you have to get the majority of people and the majority of states, or even supermajority of states. We think this is necessarily a good thing, this stopping the things that we tell you on opening opposition. But secondly, we don't think that final appeals are a very big deal in this debate, because we can, we can probably say that it can be overturned by a simple majority in Parliament in terms of creating legislation as well. Right? Okay. Two points in this debate, then. Firstly, on how we get significantly worse decisions on side government. Firstly, note the characterization here. Judges are inherently appointed by an executive of these countries. That this means that they're in there for a fixed term of life, and they necessarily have job security because of the fact that judicial independence is probably pretty important in this country. But secondly, we think they're pretty heavily trained in the law. This looks like having massive backlash uh, uh, Trained pretty heavy on the law. Note this is the case. Note how most parties are going to are going to appoint pretty trained law officials within to these legal massive constitutional courts or high courts because of two reasons. Firstly, we think there's going to be a massive amount of backlash if they don't fit the legal uh, if they don't fit the obligations to be in these high courts. Look at look at examples like America. But even if these judges are politicized, we think they're probably still going to have some level of prior experience, or at least it's going to be better than the average human in judging these laws, right? Okay, what does this mean then? Note the comparative in this debate. That is to say, politicians will always be more politicized because they're actively acting in political parties. But even if judges are, more, are as politicized as they say will be, we think they're significantly less likely to act on their view, own views because they've been trained on the importance of the Constitution in the law, as opposed to these politicians, which are inherently more politicized, inherently more short-termist, because they want to be winning elections in the future, they're going to be significantly more populist, and then more importantly, they're going to be not legally trained in the law. What does this mean then? Even if we have politicians within these states, we think they're going to be massively politicized. We think even if we want to, uh, we want to preserve the things of democracy, we think it's probably unjustified, even in the majority of cases, because of things like vote manipulation, where there's a significant amount of voter suppression and gerrymandering, which means that these politicians are not elected by the people directly. They're probably, uh, they're probably. Uh, uh, they're probably overrepresented by the minority, and but even if this isn't the case, we think people are directly voting on legislation, directly on politicians and politics based on their legal interpretation of the law. Right? There's going to be things like single issue voters that don't necessarily. Uh, that doesn't necessarily vote on the constitution itself, so it's not going to be as representative uh, as they said. Before that, closing. So, if you think that people don't understand the law, would you prefer that the government wouldn't be elected by the people that would just would appoint? Maybe specialists in certain aspects? No, because governments do other things that are not just the law, right? They have easier things to understand, things like policy. I don't understand, like, this debate isn't just about the law, right? Governments still do other things in this debate. Why are there significantly worse decisions on their side? Firstly, we think this, this is significantly more likely to be politicized. This means that there's going to be less legal interpretation of the Constitution because constitutions are now actively changing based on whichever party is in power because the interpretation of these constitutions are changes. And note how these changes are not necessarily going to be based on law, but now on, uh, on political values. What does this mean then? This means that at the point at which our world is heading towards a significant amount of more populism, we think more leaders are, are willing to see we're willing to take advantage of the uh, of the flexible constitution and willing to change change things like democratic values within their state, creating things like democratic backsliding that we tell you. But secondly, it th we think it still has long impacts on things like precedent because politicians are still less likely to consider long uh, long term implications in this debate. No talent constitution underpins the values of the country. You need overwhelming support of the people, even if we think this is trailing the actual. 
uh, the majority of the people, we think that's still a better thing for the state because of the fact that you need to protect the values of these countries. But secondly, on why you undermine the judiciary system. Firstly, we think you're creating a chilling effect to judges. That is to say, if governments can change whatever decisions you can make, we think they're more likely to suck up to the government to not have their decisions overturned. They're more likely to, do, to make decisions that appease the government to have future decisions not be overturned by the government. But secondly, we think it's going to be obviously more politically impacted because the government, the current government, is going to be is going to be changing your decisions. So you're always going to be sucking up to the current government as opposed to the entire political sphere, right? But secondly, we think that public perception, when the judicial scene is no longer seen as independent and separate, is going to create people to be concerned about the structures of the legal system, of the erosion of the legal system, and at the end of this debate, you're going to have less faith in the country's legal system and the political system. Very proud to oppose. <laughs> Taiwan has fallen. <laughs> what can I do? vast majority of instances is always only going to be reflective of the elite and always going to be overwhelmingly conservative in that. It was not enough for opening opposition to not engage with this premise and then make two arguments because all of the stuff we said is logically prior. At most, they prove why a perfect constitution will work. We gave you many, many reasons as to why the constitution in the first instance was inadequate and therefore the ability to change that in and of itself was important. What were those reasons? Because those reasons were logically prior to the entirety of the opening opposition case. Number one, oftentimes when constitutions are made, it is when the elite and the victors of a post-conflict state were able to win. What that means is that they often have really conservative votes because they were the elites and they were entrenched in power already. But also, even if they were not, recognized constitutions were oftentimes like hundreds and hundreds of years ago and values change over time. The fact that, for example, we have no longer a significant degrees of racism in specific parts of the world. We have, for example, the recognition of gender minorities. These are things that did not exist for the founding fathers like Thomas Jefferson. They exist now. Therefore, no change. So, constitution on their side, never going to encapsulate those nuances, which is important. Second of all, we proved by, as a result of the structural incentive of individuals in post-conflict states, they wanted to make sure that the constitution was hard to change. Because you know what it looked like in post-colonial states, when they think as though tomorrow the world was going to end? They wanted to over-promise and make it hard for the Constitution to topple over because they perceive the Constitution as an important part of the founding document of the state. What that meant was that they oftentimes made the barrier of entry to amending that Constitution high and almost incredible to achieve because they wanted to ensure that stability, which is why the mechanism for change was insufficient. But third, I also just think oftentimes in post-conflict states and the vast majority of contexts that both top athletes have read on, they're just things, for example, like sectarian divides and ethnic divides. That meant that oftentimes the victors of the war or the individuals who were able to decide the rules of that Constitution were able to reign, and that meant that minorities were significantly harmed. But four, and this is significant, because the old assertion is that judges are not political. Untrue. Judges are always going to be political. Do you know why? Number one, they oftentimes come from elite institutions with specific implied connotations of what political meaning they ought to have. For instance, if you come from big Ivy schools, for instance, you have more patronage to other individuals who also have the political ideology. But second of all, who the fuck you think elect judges? You think it comes out of your ass? No! It is oftentimes politicians and presidents. So you have an explicit incentive, no thank you, to represent the politician who helped you. This is why there was so much scandal around Brett Kavanaugh, because the perception was that he was always going to suck up to Trump, for example. So, this is significant, because all can only win if judges are apolitical. We put that judges are politicized for all these four reasons, alongside all of the mechanisms that Simbo failed to respond to. What then are the implications of this argument? There are two things I want to find right away. The first thing I want to find is, if on both sides of the house, judges are likely going to be politicized and therefore politicization leads to all of the harms that all wants to talk about anyways. The distinction is that on our side of the house, the appetite for discourse and the ability for the average individual on the ground to assert themselves is significantly higher. And this is also significant because if any op team in this debate wants to run an argument about political backsliding, the prerequisite claim they need to prove is why individuals on the ground have the ability to interact with the democracy or interact with the politics. We prove on our side why it was significantly easier. The reason why is because on our side, for all the reasons Sharia gives, 
you're more likely going to get politicians that wanted to pander towards individuals on the ground. Because the perception now is that you can use this as a vehement political agenda or a vehement political tool and use it in political discussions. Because on the comparative, the perception is that any single Supreme Court decision is really hard to change. So politicians never have an incentive to talk about it. On our side, you perceive it as any other political issue like your welfare and your education, and therefore there's more degrees of discussion around that. Why is that important? Why? Because the comparative on their side for all the reasons Simho gives about why uh, judges are smart asses is likely a world in which the average individual do not think they can engage with the Supreme Court. Therefore, there's significantly less discussion. This not only means that the politicization they talk about becomes significantly worse and unchecked, but also means the average individual on the ground just does not get their, represented, their views represented, which is significant because of the state power principle argument that Shari gives you. But second of all, note that this is also a long premise argument. So even if they prove that the system is good now, the issues they never provide in the future, the Constitution is also going to be representative. We prove that better on our side because if you go up seeing the Constitution constantly getting challenged, it means you think it is also acceptable to do so. That means the Constitution always becomes more dynamic and reflective with the individual views on the ground, which is significant because all context is one in which the world is perfect now. Newsflash. Some places in the world are not perfect. We make the propensity to change that significantly higher. No thank you. But third of all, and this is significant, existing electoral incentives likely means that politicians have an incentive to race to the media, and therefore individuals are likely going to be benefited. And I think it's quite important, because the op claim responding to this is just to say, populism is going to be on the rise. By the way, they don't actually explain it. They just say the word populism a couple of times. Three responses here. Number one, if, politi uh, if populism was the majoritarian view, and a lot of individuals bought into this ideology, I'm genuinely unsure why this is bad in so far as it represents the vast majority of individuals, I think opening opposition needs to prove this. But second of all, in the worst case in which populism is not reflective of the views of the people, if anything on our side, we're the only side that emboldens more people to speak out and vote against it. Because the perception is that the bar to challenging the constitution and making sure your version of the state can be represented is higher. The issue on their side is, if you perceive a populist leader to be bad and the populist leader to be overturning a bunch of things, there's no perception or the perception that you're unable to change the system and therefore you're more likely going to be disillusioned yes. and thus not going to want to participate I'll keep you in a bit. But finally, I just think this claim is untrue for the reason that the vast majority of contacts in the world, I think the average politician have incentive to be fairly liberal and appeal to individuals on the ground. The reason for this is because number one, generally speaking, individuals like having freedoms and liberties because it maximizes their choices, so they likely use that as a political narrative. But second of all, the rise of things, for example, like wealth, increasingly just is like more ability for that to be redistributed to individuals on the ground, so therefore they also become silly in voting blocks, and therefore they likely to want to seek representation as a result. Before I go to explain the implications, see you. If judges are political and the public is easily angry because the constitution is so unrepresentative of them, doesn't that mean that the public is likely to agitate to either change the constitution either by pressuring judges apparently or by changing the constitution within the legislature? Yes, that is our case. We think that is a good thing because then the constitution becomes more dynamic. On your side, the public is pissed but they don't think they can change the constitution. Therefore, they either no longer vote and they feel disillusioned with the state and not represented. This is why on our side of the house it is better. But the second reason why we're winning is because regardless of the starting point of the constitution, we prove two independent impacts that were important. The first is just to say, even in the best case of judges, there are oftentimes timeline issues that mean judges are not fairly representative. One, because there's a high bar, so you need to be like get a lot of degrees, so therefore you're often fairly old. But two, the way judges work is that you get permanent tenure. So even if you're liberal or reflective of people now, by the time you're in power and you stay in power, you no longer reflect the new generation. Our mechanism is a far more speedier mechanism to get individual representation. But finally, and this is significant, we also went in a subset of cases in which the initial creation of the constitution becomes better. Because Sharia proves why for a variety of reasons, the initial starting point of creating a constitution oftentimes always favors the elite. We change this because the perception now is you need to include these individuals in that discussion. Otherwise, they're just going to back out of the state or constantly barat up, like badger you in that democracy. So therefore, there's more incentive to include minorities in that discussion in the close complex interval. For all those reasons, OGs clearly when they talk that. I thank every Prime Minister for that speech to close the front half. I call upon the leader. Thank you. If I could change the rules of debating within the debate, that gives me unlimited power over the outcome of that debate. And that is the problem with opening government's case, because when you give the governments the power to overturn the very systems that hold them to account, 
you give them absolute power to do whatever they want. If Donald Trump had the ability to overturn the United States Constitution, overturn the decision of the Supreme Court about whether his challenge to the Constitution was correct, that gives him unlimited power in order to overturn democracy. That is the harm that opening government never contends with. And note, if you just weigh this harm, and I'm going to do some more weighing later, against the vague claims that they give you about being slightly more representative, never explain why those claims manifest in any actual benefit for people on the ground, our claim clearly wins up. Three things in this speech. Firstly, I'm going to deal with their premise that constitutions are bad. Secondly, I'm going to deal with why decisions are better under our side. And thirdly, on perception. Firstly, let's deal with their premise that constitutions are bad and incredibly unrepresentative. The first thing they miss is the comparative, no thank you, is that the state, you know, the state today is unrepresentative for many of the same reasons they identify. If you talk about elites being entrenched in power, those reasons also exist under opening government's world. It is not the case that they explain why those, those reasons are not incredibly symmetric. The second thing to note here is if these constitutions are so deeply unrepresentative as opening government claims, there are mechanisms to change them. In many countries, no thank Thank you. Constitutions are not as entrenched as they are in the United States. In Australia, you only need 50% in 50% of the states in order to change the constitution. In many countries, you need, a, you need a majority to change these constitutions, but it is not incredibly difficult so that it's like impossible to change them. If it is the case that it is so, one, these changes that they are talking about are so popular, then they would be changed under our side as well. Which means that the cases we are dealing with under opening government are cases of 50% plus one of the population want some constitutional change change, but you know, 40% or 49% do not want that change. Compared to, you know, for example, on our side, maybe is a larger figure, like 60, 40, or you know, two thirds or whatever. That means that their impact is quite small. The third thing to say is it's not the case that these constitutions just came out of nowhere and that the elites only created them. In many instances in these countries, there were large and very long constitutional conventions to discuss what this constitution should look like, to discuss enshrining individual liberties within these countries. In many instances, when you had minority communities within those countries that wanted to feel seen within those countries, they were given a process to opt into those conventions. And the very obvious reason why that is the case is if you do not allow minority communities in your country to participate in constitutional conventions, one, the constitution is not representative, so you cannot stand by the fact that you are representing the whole of the people, and secondly, that's going to lead to massive backlash within those nascent states, which means that those states are going to have much, uh, like, like large degrees of conflict post-creation. Uh, uh, the last thing to say here is that many constitutions in the world are not the United States Constitution like they are talking about. Most constitutions learn from the fact that the United States was an incredibly thick constitution and had a whole lot of like rules about different things. Most constitutions contain the basic framework for democracy, the basic rules that set out how the political system should operate. Things like the separation of powers, ignored by opening government, those are things that we entrench in society, those are important important tools. The takeaway from this premise is that constitutions are effective, they are important, and they are broadly representative of the people. But let's then take them at their very, very best and say the constitutions are incredibly unrepresentative. The reason they are still important, one, they set up the political framework. So even if some of the laws within this constitution are unrepresentative, the political framework is still an important thing to preserve. Because if you overturn that, you do not have any certainty about how things are going to go in the future. You allow the government to massively like have the tyranny of the majority over the minority communities within those countries. Oftentimes, it is the political framework of those, these countries that protects minorities, that gives them a voice. For example, if you have rep like representative senates in terms of like proportional representation, that gives minorities a voice in these, in, in these states, which means that it can be overturned under opening government's world. The important way I want to give you here then is note the comparative. On their world, the decisions that they get that we do not get are like 50% plus one of the population. There is a small threshold of decisions that they get that we do not get under our world. Compare that to the chance of the like of, of populist government overturning political framework, the impacts of that are incredibly disastrous for these countries. It means that the majority can run tyranny over everyone in those countries. It means that if you win a single election, you can entrench your power through, uh, through absurd means into the future. That is the harm that opening well, government does not contend with. That is why we're winning this debate from this point. I'll take closing. At the best case scenario, the poor may be one that is an ability to change the constitution. Not why there is an incentive for, for, for politicians to actually do that. And therefore, they can, their case can just... Okay, here, here is why there is a clear incentive. One, 
if you change the constitution to allow yourself to make, remain in power or make it more difficult for uh, like the opposition party to, re, uh, to regain power, that entrenches your power long term. That means you have long term future prospects. And the obvious examples you point to are individual states within the United States where their constitutions are quite easy to change and many countries, they change the way gerrymandering laws work so that they can implement further gerrymandering in those states and make it more difficult to lose power. They actively change the constitutions within those states so that they can entrench their own power into the future. That is the problem when you have a constitution that is incredibly easy to change and that can be overturned by the whim of the majority at any point. That means on their side it is far, far worse. On our side, when that constitution is harder to change, not only do you have the security of it being harder to change in the first place, but you have the perception of people talking about the importance of the constitution, the importance of the constitution being stable and certain into the long term. That is something you do not get when, under opening government's exact framing, they want to talk about this constitution being easy to change and being changed on a whim all the time, which means that people think that they should be changed and should not underlie the political system. Let's lastly deal with the comparative of judges, politicians, who make the best decisions. The first thing here is their unproven premise is that these decisions about constitutions should be representative of the people's will, rather than on a legal interpretation of these constitutions. They do not actually prove that premise, which means they cannot get up on that point in the first place. Then they say politicians, they, they say judges are elite without also noting the comparative politicians come from the same Ivy League schools in many instances. Then they say judges are politicized. Again, compare this to politicians who are always politicized. On our side, at least, there is incentives to do things like have appointment processes because you want to, to at least have the perception of separation of powers. There's things like judicial codes of conduct, which means you cannot actively be biased towards political party, parties. Even if that bias seeps in, compare that onto opening government's world, it is far, far worse. Then, note they also never talk about politicians in this debate. We told you reasons why politicians could be broadly unrepresentative. Closing government says, well, why don't we just appoint all politicians? But that's because of parliamentary supremacy. We do not allow parliament to overturn the decisions that keep them to account, the constitutions that hold their power to account. That is why opening opposition takes this debate. In 2016, the Israeli government said, we have too many refugees. Let's just put them in a camp in the middle of the desert and let them be there. Then the Supreme Court said, that, look, there is a constitution and we have a, a, a prime law, like a constitutional law that says there is the dignity of a man and thus we can't put them in that camp. Then it was dissolved. But then the Israeli government said, wait, with 51% of the vote, I can change my own constitution. So what they did is not just put that law back that put the refugees in the camp, but just prevent the basic constitutional law of having the dignity of a man. That is to say that every next judicial decision could not actually rely on that. That is what side opening composition brings to you. Because they say, ah, it's many times easy to say the constitution. This is much worse. Because on their side, that is to say, we change the basic constitution that protects many rights. That is to say, they, pro they want that the fourth amendment or the fourth amendment will be protected, will be just put away because politicians don't want to protect abortions, be against abortions. So that is just a worse world to live in. This in and of itself flips what we've gotten from side opening opposition. Look, OG Cummins says, look, it's hard to change the constitution, you need a special majority. Oh, Cummins says, look, but you can uh, change the, ma the constitution, that is the right way. We explain to you specifically now why we are likely to actually do the, uh, uh, we are, why the cases that we are talking about are the cases that are important and where constitution won't be changed and specifically why they are hugely important for representation. Let's start, our buttons will be integrated. First, what actual decisions will be made and where? So firstly, and this is super crucial, we think that the government doesn't have the incentive to put that all, all together. Let's give you more structural reasons, because OG oh, come and tell, yeah, in general, backlash, we don't want to upset the people, don't change the constitution. Let's get more into it. Firstly, there is always a quid pro quo between the government and the justice system. That is to say, there is always, and you cannot always be, be against them, and, you, and they're always uh, judged there, so you don't want to just upset them too much in of itself. 
success. So that is, that is so important. Secondly, just because of our results and many times friends, and this is important. Secondly, we think that the, uh, the, politi the judges now have a huge incentive to justify themselves. That is to say, they make their laws and decisions clearer and the public able to see and listen to what they are actually telling. To see pictures, understand what they are actually talking about, have a disincentive for Christians to do that. Fairly, look, a majority that is a clear majority, let's say more than 51%, and getting all the people actually to vote for that is not so easy, yeah? You don't have so many votes for that in Panama. This takes some huge power. Now, oh, can I tell, ah, but we'll become a dictatorship. Let's get more into of why that's not likely the case. First, this is super important. When you're actually having so much support for actually disrupting the democracy, you have so many alternatives. You can literally, and they literally, the politician of the regime has control of the army. That is to say, when you have the talk about voter intimidation, we talk about financing of the electoral system and actually prevent that, like we've seen in Mexico right now, when the INE gets much less financial support and just to have less polling booths on all these things. When you talk about campaigning laws and all these things and the ability to literally bribe people and bribe all these people, think that it is much easier than what I'm talking about. Secondly, we think that there is a difference between having a law that is not super aligned to the constitution and changing the constitution. This is super important. When the constitution says every person has a vote, they cannot come and say, look, no, and not every person has a vote. That is different than changing something that, that is not directly against the constitution, for example, the dignity of a man or something like that. This is important. But lastly, we think that, look, with saying ah, people want to stay in power. Look, there is no one law that guarantees you to stay in power after the four years that you have. You can have much more chance. But what is the problem here? This is a clear slippery slope for the politicians. That is, they understand there is a snowball here, that if they do that, it will be, if, and then another government comes in, it will be much easier for another government to even make more laws that is against them. So they feel that they will not be in power at all of all this time. Last thing at many times, there are smaller parties there that know that many times any such law will actually happen. So it is super unlikely that it will happen. It, it will happen. So let's talk more about representatives and representatives, the ones who understand that we have actually good uh, what are the cases. So, look, with the already idea that we don't want to have an expert, uh, uh, expert government, they said, ah, because people don't understand law. Yeah, the financial system is so clear. Like, really, have you seen a budget? Like, have you seen the GDP? Any explanation whatsoever? None. So let's understand what is actually wrong. Because OG said, ah, yes, we take the right and we should give the right. But according to OG, we should let everyone live our what life he wants and however he wants and the social contract in and of is unjustified. But we understand that we need to actually force people into something. We force people into choosing their pension, something like that. We think a basic contract as the constitution and basic ability of democracy is needed for staying in representativeness and therefore we force people into the democracy. But why do we want representative other than that? Before I move on, I will take first. The constitution says that every person has a vote. I, as a politician, bring the case that only white people are people. <laughs> what makes me over... What stops me from overturning this decision? We think that firstly, as we said already, you have many alternatives. Third, you don't think that this is actually the likely case as we talk. Thirdly, yeah, it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a clear difference between changing the constitution, which is not the motion, than actually having a law that has some contradiction. Let's move on. We think that representative is important just because we really, and this is important, don't know what is good. This is super important in several situations. Firstly, and yes, it sounds ba bullshit, but we don't have epistemic access. We don't know who is actually enjoying or not enjoying himself with what he does. And we don't know what utility is for each person. Secondly, we don't have the ability to actually prefer someone over the other, know who is more important. Thirdly, we think that we literally have research of morals for hundreds, thousands of years, and we still didn't decide almost anything. Do we have actually ability and burden to help our citizens, to help another citizen in another country? Literally no decision whatsoever on the basic school of thought there is no decision what is important. So why should the, should the citizens decide? First, because we think that autonomy is something that we agree upon. We think that the basic autonomy of everyone in the country should be actually granted, and therefore you should actually have the decision to do that. Secondly, we think that there is a more importance of more people and more knowledge is more important. We think that in general, decisions of more people means to more good in the world, and that is the best way to get that. Now we say, now they tell us, ah, but they don't know. 
really? They can't know? They can't know, for example, they believe that they have a moral duty to help other citizens to get refugees in or not get refugees in? Really? They don't know if they believe that LGBT rights or abortion should be good or bad? We think that the moral burden for, is for the citizens to decide that because they are the best representative and the only representative of the real democracy and the, it has satisfied to do it otherwise. I call you to propose. not about the Constitution, uh, just about the Constitution and the integrity of the law per se. Honestly, I think most people in government probably realize that a Constitution written, don't know how many years ago, by some pasty old white men shouldn't actually be taken word for word into account. Um, even in the U.S., like, should show, I guess, uh, I think the Constitutionists are taking on some originalist interpretation, which I don't think is more important, here, the important point here overall, right? I think the question here is what's the goal of the Supreme Court and how it protects the most basic fundamental rights people have or should have, and in doing so, provide a sense of stability and security in decision making for everyday people's lives. No, for all OG talks about how, um, I guess, like, people matter, I have no clue how just ensuring 50% is needed to pass decisions in legislature, um, and is actually supposed to ma maximize people's rights to be represented, especially when those politicians are just as out of touch and elitist, presumably, and ideological as they see our Supreme Court justices to be, and also given that they also probably don't really give a shit about minorities if their constituents don't really rely on minorities to actually be voted in. So, new contribution in CO. Firstly, why is the Supreme Court or Constitutional Court crucial for, for providing a sense of stability that allows people to make important decisions for themselves every day and survive in a way that they can't on that side when you have no idea when, when or how things might change in the future? Secondly, why on, a, on their side they act when, when they just have a simple majority? In fact, that actually just worsens the kind of backsliding because the Supreme Court and Constitutional Court is actually a mechanism on our side uniquely in politics that actually prevents and that creates a source of, uh, source of reassurance and also prevents violence in the long run. And this is something that OO neglects to explain. Okay, all rebuttals will be integrated from this point on. So the first thing then, on why we actually think we're able to better ensure that fundamental rights are enshrined in a way where there's a sense of stability and security. They say the constitutional court is always going to be conservative, elitist, unrepresentative. Again, I think there's already enough discussion and debate about how we can change fundamental things in the constitution if that's actually a really bad thing. But I think also, they really neglect the unique benefit of the constitution or just the court in general to interpret the constitution in a certain way and therefore protect everyday basic rights, right? It's a unique trait, which is that you're not actually seeking to create change or like try to create a legacy for yourself through change to create an atmosphere of change that Governments and like popular politicians can write popular sentiment on and therefore win favor and like win elections on, right? The important thing is that constitutional courts allow you to actually preserve and conserve important decisions, issues that are super serious to everyday individuals, right? Whether it's more uh, a marriage, abortion, uh, like freedom of speech, right? These things on the other side are now subject to be overturned whenever the next administration or party becomes more popular and has more political advantages. Okay, so all touches on this, but let's talk about how this changes the everyday calculus of individuals, which is actually the real, real uh, push down impact that we care about, right? Because it just jeopardizes your everyday decision making because what you want to talk what uh, oh I guess I want to talk about is mostly at the formal political level, right? What happens is twofold, right? Security is lost, first of all. You know no no longer know as an average average individual individual what the norm and standard for the law in everyday existence is because that might change in a few months or years when a new election happens. For example, if you are an abortion clinic in status quo, in the next election, if you're worried about some other Republican party or some third party coming to power, that means you're absolutely screwed right now. That means your existing modus operandi and resources are all meaningless, right? Even if right now the, the story uh, the, 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 store, like the, the norm and standard in most countries is like being anti-abortion. That means still the underground abortion clinics that have all their operations set forward, all their like, uh, I guess like cross-border mechanisms and also just underground ways of actually contacting and interacting with people who need those services. Those become jeopardized at the point at which you thought you were going to have a chance in the next election, but because of an overturning that happened, you realize that actually all the plans you had to actually become a legitimate force is fucked. That's why there's the house, the lack of stability and security that you feel as an individual is what fucks over people who think or might not 
state that their rights are being tried in the future. That's why they actually don't get more better decision making for individuals on the ground. On our side, within the rules and knowledge and confines and trying by the Supreme Court, you know what is expected. You can plan and make decisions within the confines of the law. Yes, maybe it's conservative and status quo, but at least you have the security and knowledge of knowing what your options are and to plan for those in the short term and the long term. They don't have that on our side. The second impact then on the security of uh, the stability thing is actually not just the individuals, but the overall societal adherence to the law, right? I think on our side, we uniquely have permanency. On their side, if things are going to change likely, why should you follow the law at all, right? Because I think the idea is the respect for the rule of law happens on our side, the point at which there is a repetition and a habit of following the most fundamental laws, like the freedom of speech, like letting other people say what they want to, like actually letting people marry who they want to. There's a, right, there's, there's a sense of, like, of, of, of stability being uh, secured and rep through repetition, right? I think on that side, if popular change is the norm, that means the uh, enforcement of the law also becomes harder at the point at which there's a lot of culture and norms around repeating these, uh, repeating the adherence to laws, right? That's, uh, so also then, also then to caveat, right? I think on our side, that means at the le le legislature level, fundamental rights are still being ensured, right? Uh, just look at how like things like uh, gay, gay marriage rights was just confirmed and enshrined by the uh, by the Senate, by Biden Senate in the status quo. I think that means on our side, there's no ability to actually say our side will only just uh, go against all progressive uh, people, progressive political changes. I think the unique thing on our side is the fundamental things like freedom of speech, right to marriage, these basic things are enshrined at the point at which you have a sense of stability and security on our side. We can still protect other things as well. The last thing that on them is that they fighting. I think their side is actually much more likely to create a sense of violence, and this is what all misses out uniquely, right? In democracy, especially setting authority states or states where electoral democracy is the only bar for democracy, they're not actually stand a substantive democracy. I think the Supreme Court acts as a check and balance, right? The value here is that the Supreme Court inspires respect for its worth and value and like its interpretation of the law. Secondly, fear for its power to actually make you legitimate or illegitimate, right? The impact of this is this. For example, in more extreme context, which I think all of them really touch on, forces such as military, other bureaucratic institutions like banks, the respect for you and your authority as a Supreme Court means they are less likely to pull up risky movements like mobilization or coups, right? In the semi authoritarian context, that means these Supreme Courts are the, the end-all, be-all, like tipping point that ensures stability and not lack of violence in that school. Even if not talking about extreme context, then how do we actually ensure less violence, right? That means that election and political events happen. On that side, there is a sense of instability because people engaged. don't see a check and balance. Before I move on, is there a point of opening? If 51% of people actually want to take away your rights and then they vote in a populist, on their side, when they sack the court, they can never have their in change, change, change in the future. At least on our side, we have a discussion that can change that in the future. Stability is on a priori. Okay, again, given all the analysis we gave you about how the, for, the Supreme Court is supposed to stability and the decisions that are made there are in the long term and open over a long pass of time, I'm not sure how you're going to roll back those decisions so easily. And except for fucking unique context at the US, which I don't think is really something we need to defend across the world right now, I think on yours in the house, at the point at which, again, these turnovers happen much more quickly, you're, unable to, you're, you're more, much more likely to roll back on fundamental rights. Okay, so last thing, on the instability stuff. I think, for example, if like you see like Brazil or Spain in the past, like, during its democratic transition, that's precisely what you saw because of a lot, because there was a Supreme Court there back to ensure stability. That's why you're less likely to see people actually going out to protest on the street uh, and be violent and actually uh, uh, voice their grievances in a violent manner. At the point at which you know that the Supreme, Supreme Court, court, uh, court is a force that can provide a check and balance against authoritarian leaders and elites, right? For example, that on our, that on their house, that's uniquely why I think Supreme Court's um, at the point at which they are subject to being taken over by the le 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 legislature, that's when they're not less likely to be able to provide the source of authority and stability. I think the simple counterfactual is this, right? On their side, it's not actually that more people matter is important, right? On our side, uniquely, at the point at which you actually need require a super majority, I think that's when you're more, more representative and less likely to pass controversial decisions that just make the 50% barrier. On our side, we protect, uh, we provide the stability as well as provide a lack of violence in the long run. I thank the member of opposition for that speech to have the case of the government vanish and all of the Constitution does not always 
say that minorities are always going to be included as well. Constitution have a general idea that was uh, uh, that was written, and now courts interpreted that general idea. This is what exactly what we saw in the United States, right? The, right. No, thank you, thank you later. The Constitution says that person have a right to his body, right? But now they interpret it in a way that says, no, 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 woman doesn't have a right to her body, but the baby within it has a right to not die within that body, and therefore they were able to actually make abortions not legal. Why this is crucial, Father? Because A, we don't get all the benefits of freedom of speech and basic right that we won't be guaranteed because they can be overturned by interpretation on the other side as well. And secondly, even if they prove to you, we don't think that stable things are, are good things. Therefore, I'm truly confused by their case. I'm going to, to talk about three main things. A, changing the constitution. Secondly, what is the, the likely scenario that we're talking about with that it was missing in open, uh, in open government? I'm going to talk about it. And then representation, why this is the most important thing in this debate. Let's just start. Changing the constitution, because of this. Open government explains you that now the constitution does not reflect what the public right now wants, and it's hard to change the constitution because we need a special, uh, a special uh, uh, voting to do it. Open the position says, look, if the constitution do uh, really doesn't reflect what people want right now, uh, uh, then they can change it. And if enough people want, then we will be able to make that specific change in order to do that. We think that we explain exactly why even if the constitution does not, uh, right now doesn't reflect what the public wants, it is hard to change it. And why is that? My partner explains to you that today, opposition, for example, when, it, when we're talking about constitution, opposition doesn't vote in order to change the constitution, not because it does not represent what the public wants, but because opposition, opposition wants to have this, the political credit that they have, that, that they were the ones to change it. Meaning, even if, we are, if, even if most of the government actually agrees upon the fact that we need to change the constitution, shh, the, the reason why it doesn't happen is not just because it's hard to get the vote, but because it's hard to get the vote because of political reasons and not because it does not reflect the, uh, the, 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 uh, the public. Why is it crucial? Because A, notice that many of the cases given to by opening op opposition is, relies upon the fact that we have an alternative, right? We can just change the constitution whenever we want. Once my partner explains to why is it not the case, even when the constitution is not representative, it takes down many of the alternatives given to you by opening opposition. And secondly, notice, it means that we won't have the ability to change things in the long term, even when they're good, like closing opposition wants. Once we have no alternatives to actually change the constitution, this is where the debate happens happens, right? Because this is what we need to know. How do we do the good things when we don't have the ability to change the constitution like they offer to you? This is where the cases that we're talking about are crucial, but, right? Because we explain to you exactly why we're not talking about a, a, a decision that are going to make all these required it can help. We're not talking about cases where we, where, when those people want to become dictatorship, right? My partner explains to you two main reasons why that's not the case. A, because notice, if we have a democratic state, it's not an easy, to, it's not a, 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 an easy thing to, to do to assume that that specific leader just wants to become a dictatorship. We are asking a POI open government. Even if they have the ability to become a dictatorship because of, that, uh, 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 because of the motion, why do they have the incentive to do that? The only answer that they say is because ah, people want to stay in power and therefore they will do whatever they think they can in order to stay in power. power. But not as far as this is crucial. If people want to stay in power and will do everything they, in their power in order to do that, they have many other alternatives in order to do that. They don't have to change specifically the constitution. My partner expects you, they have the army. They have a lot of other ways to not just change the constitution, but also add other laws in power. They can just have a lot of money in order to make sure that those things will happen. They can just ban from the opposition to be on the media. And therefore, we think that the extreme case that opening government are talking about are going to happen anyway. And they don't need to have these specific rules. Secondly, they will explain you exactly why people just don't want to do that. Opening, up, opening government starts by saying people want their freedom and therefore they, uh, uh, politicians won't take their freedom away. My partner explains to you more than that, right? They explain to you that even if people want freedom, politicians are just afraid to take it from them because it's not that easy to become a dictatorship. It takes years to pass the law. It takes years to see what the court has done. And it takes years to overturn what the court has won. It's not in one contention with the, where you can make become a dictatorship, and therefore they will be afraid to just do laws that will then overturn and maybe help themselves. 
This is why we think that, we're, that politicians will only take the cases where they feel that the public is not being represented enough by what we're doing right now. And this is what we need to enter, uh, this is the crucial part of this debate. Before I continue, I will take opening. If governments have the power to interpret whether voter suppression or gerrymandering conflict with the right to vote, they have unlimited power to manipulate future elections. Your side gets rid of the one accountability mechanism for those politicians. Yeah, but sorry, okay, again, extreme cases where people want to do that, they have other alternatives to do that. I'm totally not sure why is that going to be the case. Represent, representation, right? Because when we explain that we're, looking about, we're not talking about those extreme cases, but we're talking about places where the, the public isn't being represented right now by the law. Why this is crucial, panel? Because we think that represent representation is just logically prior to everything else, right? Because notice, in a democracy, we don't have an objective good or an object objective bad, right? This is why we elect people each credential from the get-go, because we think that good and bad changes over time. This is why we don't have specialists as the government, but we vote for them. Because we think that in order to actually understand what is good and what is bad, we need to know what the public right now wants and what the public right now needs. Even if it's going to change in four years, we just think that's a good thing. This is why we change governments every four years. And we think that once we explain to you why we get more representation specifically on the cases where the public most feel like they need it, this is where we win this, uh, this debate. And second, you know, this, this is crucial things that the politicians are going to change where the public feels like they're most damaged and most affected. And this is the case where we win this debate. Not the extreme side and not just explaining why representation is there, but why this is crucial. central contribution that closing opposition brought to this debate was a bit of intellectual honesty. They understood that you cannot just assume what is going to be passed by the legislature or by the court. And that's why stability becomes the one thing that courts actually give you that misrepresentation from CG should take them out by based on just basic debating honesty. I want to talk about two things. First, which side protects democratic institutions. Second, which side reflects the people's will and consequently what is the best way in which we can forward the country. First, on democratic institutions. Opening up say that there's gerrymandering laws, etc. that may be passed in certain contexts. One, I don't think they prove why this is the most important or the most likely context, and also they don't prove why this is likely to be accepted by the public in subsequent elections, even if gerrymandering does happen. But more than that, I think God with rebuts them, but not us. Here's why. She spends extensive amount of time pointing out that on that side, it's not likely that one politician is going to nuke the whole election and remove future fairness in elections. And I agree. The extension from Amy was different because what Amy pointed out was that when you have the ability to change everything with no checks and balances, sit down, then there is no stability whatsoever. When there is no stability whatsoever, when everything is on the line, that's when people are not willing to lose elections. That's when people are absolutely desperate to ensure that they can stay out in power and take out and keep out a subsequent government. Amy points out that that is when violence happens, when you're not willing to lose an election for four years because in that four years your whole life could change. That extension of Amy got no response whatsoever. And what does that mean? That means that if you talk about the most important harm to people's lives, their lives, the ability to, to like, live in a safe and secure environment, that became significantly more endangered on that side. If you talk about coups and the likelihood of military deciding they need to step in, that became significantly more likely on that side because of that lack of stability. In comparison, we apply in a much more greater majority of instances. Because sure, those incentives that you talk about might apply when you want to nuke the next election. But when you're scared of what's going to happen as a result of the past election, and you don't know what's happening yet, that uncertainty is a much more likely mechanism to apply across a range of contexts within the closing of opposition. But also, if you want to talk about their stuff, closing opposition's concern, or like the explanation of the people's concerns, is logically prior to them because it explains why people would have that incentive in the first place. Globally, therefore, these are the most important instances that we told you about in closing opposition. The OG's response to this is we need to have discussion because discussion is what keeps democracy alive. This is absolute bullshit. 
First, you will discuss this anyway. If this has such a great impact on your life, people don't just sit there as for the US, they do litigate about this. And Amy's point was to point out that on gay marriage, for example, the litigation has happened to a, such a significant degree that the Senate passed these protections with a large majority support. But secondly, just because you don't discuss a certain number of things like gay marriage does not logically equate to you will not discuss democracy at large because so many other policies happen on a simple majority. That argument is absolute bollocks. Consequently, only we get you the most likely and wide-ranging explanation for why democratic institutions were under critical threat on that side of the house with absolute impact on people's lives. We avoided that with the existence of safeguards. That's why we win. Secondly, let's talk about which side reflects the people's group. And I want to point out that there's just a logical inconsistency with opening opposition. They both say that they're going to make it really easy to change the constitution and say that they want to protect hide behind legal expertise as a reason for why you can't let 50%. But if 50% of people can change constitutions, that suggests that there's no legal a priori basis to the wording of the constitution. And that's why closing opposition comes in by recognizing that is the reality. We acknowledge that 67% can change the constitution and has changed the constitution, which means that the constitution is still centrally what about the people's will. Consequently, we also recognize that no one can guarantee what people will vote for and what judges will do. That's why Amy's extension is important, because Amy's extension explains to you reaction and response. That given that sometimes you don't have the best situation, people have the ability to respond to that and be able to find ways around that, to know whether they can actually open an abortion clinic, or to know whether, for example, there is a need to, to commit money to long-term policies that allow women from the South to have abortions in the North. All of these are not going to happen in the world, but it's a 50-50 because put the, all the effort you put to setting this up could be eradicated in four years if the next government changes. So even in that worst-case scenario, we allow for response. But I want to know that that is a worst-case scenario because in many instances, what's more likely to happen is the 40 years that we did have access to abortions in the South and a world in which, in that period, we were able to enshrine that because of the permanency of these decisions, because that legal precedent actually lasted for a generation. Those wins got no response whatsoever from that speech, which makes them critically important. But secondly, we talked about adherence, and this was important, because the response of the clip from Sharia is, it is important for people to respond and listen to the law and majority rule. We agree, but if majority rule is only going to last four years and it's so uncertain, that reduces the incentive for people to listen in the first place and actually put practice and real-life implication and effect to the laws that are passed. Consequently, the permanency of these institutions, the fact that you can't just hope that they will change very quickly, is important, especially because these are fundamental rights that we thought had to be protected because they literally affected the entire lives of people. This is not whether you pay 10% or 20% tax. This is about whether you have the ability to abort a child or be stuck with that child for the rest of your life. It was that extraordinary importance that meant stability in those facts. Being able to react was the most important thing in this debate. Sharia. Opposition's case is that the rules should be followed because that leads to fairness and stability. We prove the rules themselves are unfair and it's more stable when people know the decisions and are involved in them so they follow them in the long term. You don't prove that stability is going to happen because these rules can change anyhow. The difference is that on outside you can stick with them and actually be able to implement them when good things happen, where bad things happen, we give you mechanisms as to why they change. Let's deal with representation directly. Because OG doesn't actually represent everybody. They represent small swing states, like eight states deciding an American election. The difference on our side is that we mechanize representation. They say politicians might pull to the median to get 51%. It is so much more likely they do so, and you need 67% to make a change. That additional 70%, which is the real distinction in this debate, is what allowed for more representative decision making to come out of closing opposition directly flipping that analysis. And better, by the way, that OO does respond according to the individual whims and fancies of people and how they may or may not be reflected. We take a structural reason for why we are more likely to be representative. More than that, I think closing government's response is that it's a lack of representation when the, uh, when the uh, policy changes. I think one, they ignore the judicial activism mechanism that came out in Amy, which points out that in reality, people have been able to change accordingly with the interpretation that's important. But secondly, I posit that if it's true that it doesn't reflect because it didn't change enough, that simply reflects the lack of genuine support that exists for that policy, for that policy to be changed on that side of the house. Insofar as that, the problem on that side is the implications of a lack of stability meant that they are overly reflective of a small subset of people to the detriment of many other individuals who have their lives upturned every four years. There was a much more significant harm coming out of the CG that we thought we shouldn't accept. That is how we oppose. Alright, thank you everybody for the debate.